Welcome to Freedom Friday at the River. I am so excited to get to interview someone you now know as a familiar face, Bishop Lance Johnson. Welcome, brother. So good to be here with you today. I'm excited uh, about all the amazing things that God's doing and just excited to be on Freedom Friday with you and uh, just to be able to uh, share a little bit about what God's doing. Well, I got privy to uh, your testimony. I think the first time you ever preached um, at the river, we ended up getting to go to lunch and got to hear about um, what God did with you concerning freedom and anger. And I was like, people need to hear this. You know, I know when you're ministering, you do share a bit of that. But just for the sake of Freedom Friday, I wanted to cover that. So this is pre-recorded, by the way. It's pre-recorded because my it's my anniversary this weekend, and I won't be here on Friday. So we're, this is actually Freedom Wednesday. Well, happy <laughs> anniversary! Thank you, and I hope you'll share it, especially with those that come to your mind as you are listening to this testimony. So, Bishop Lance Johnson, you set it up and just share what God did in your life when you weren't sure that it could ever happen. Well, you know, when I got born again, I got radically transformed from a, being a drug addict and alcoholic. Um, but there was one thing that didn't leave, even though it was better, and that was my temper. Uh, I was set free from drug addiction, alcoholism, and, and certainly became a brand new person. And, and, and let me just say this, my temper was far better because I had a very, very violent temper, not one that I abused people. Back in the world, I guess you could say I probably did. I, I fought a lot and uh, mainly because of my temper, but um, I, mostly just having those fits of screaming and raging and, and anger that would just come out. It was, it was second nature to me before I got born again. And then when I got saved, it got a lot better but it could still find its way to the surface under extreme circumstances. And as a believer and, and even a pastor over the years, I had prayed and sought God and I had went away even times of praying and fasting that I would, uh, I would go away and, and rent a cabin and just pray and ask God to completely set me free from, from this anger. Um, and, and never, any, to any real success to where I could tell that it was really gone. And, um, and I struggled with it. I battled with it for tw over almost 30 years as a Christian because I was born again in 1990 and I was only really set free about, uh, about almost about three years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, God really delivered me from that. And, and I think part of the reason for that is because consciously I had felt like that I had, um, dealt with some issues from my childhood and from my past. I had, um, I grew up in a, a very abusive home that I didn't talk a lot about. And the reason I never talked about it or dealt with it is because my dad got born again. And when he was saved, he became a much different person than he was when we were children growing up. So I just never talked about that side of my testimony. I felt like when my dad got saved, I had dealt with everything. But the truth is, is I really hadn't dealt with it. And uh, just prior to my dad's death, um, I had uh, some things that came up that I had to really deal with. And our, that anger began to come up inside of me. And um, it was really, I, I don't even know how to put this into words. It was hurt. It was like all the years of, of the things that we went through as children, the physical abuse, the verbal abuse, the, the screaming, the hollering, all of the things that we were subjected to as children coming up it all welled up inside of me because of a family issue that arose prior to my dad's death. Um, because, there, and I won't get into the details of that just because this is public and it's airing, but uh, uh, it, it really caused everything to surface inside of me. And I realized that everything in my life wasn't healed as I thought it was. And, and, and I don't want to say that we're hypocritical. I believe I was trying to be transparent with God as possible. But the, the truth is, Lisa, I had things in my life that I thought I had dealt with, but it wasn't dealt with. And, and I think that I put on that religious mask, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I confessed the right things. I prayed the right things. I did all the right things. 
but inside there were still scars and wounds and, and still the things that, uh, that come up inside of me that, uh, I just believed I had dealt with. Do you think the, the anger and the rage you dealt with, even as a believer that all of it was just rooted into unresolved wounds from a child? Uh, certainly believe, uh, I believe some of it was, was really what I call learned behavior. And I don't know if that's the right terminology. Some people call it a curse, but I think it's, it's learned behavior. The Bible says the sins of the father are visited upon the children to the third and the fourth generation. And I know there's been a lot of teachings about that, but let me just say this. We as a church have done a great job in telling people that, 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 that the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. But sometimes we fail to explain that not only did Christ come to deal with the sins that we commit, but also the power of the sins that were committed against us that work death in our life that we don't realize need to be healed. And, and it, like I say, we grew up in a very volatile home where, you know, the, the, the abuse was pretty, pretty significant. Um, today it would land you in jail, um, you know, to the point that I re received whoopings with hickory till blood ran out of us from our neck to our ankles, uh, screamed and hollered at just un, just unmeasurably hit in a, in a moment of violence or anger the loss of temper knocked across the floor um just i and and saw that in our whole family uh saw it against my mom and uh and you know again i'm not trying to paint my dad in this horrific picture because i love my dad my dad was not that man when he died um and when he left this world my dad was born again he was my best friend um there were some things and complications that happened before his death that my dad really turned away from us children uh, in his latter years, right before his death. And that's the part I just, you know, we'll just leave out, but, but that's where the hurt came in. And that's where things started stirring up on the inside of me that, that I wasn't healed. And, and I didn't know at the time, Lisa, to be honest with you, that that was where my anger stemmed from and where my temper stemmed from, even though now in hindsight, I see it. So it's easier for me to talk about and explain to people. But at the time that I was going through it, I didn't necessarily acknowledge it as that. Um, I just, I just knew that at that moment when, you know, it was at a moment when our family should be drawing together, you know, I'm dealing with issues in my personal life from, from my childhood, you know, I'm 54 years old, uh, things are supposed to be resolved in that many years, but, uh, they, they just weren't resolved. Okay. So you prayed about it. It concerns you that you had a temper, right? Oh, very much so. I was under conviction continually about it, even though I can count on one hand how many times it happened as a, as a Christian. Just the fact that it could happen uh, was not acceptable to me. Um, and there were times that it, it hurt my it hurt my integrity. It hurt my character. Uh, I don't believe it's the example that Jesus would have said in some cases. Um, and, and, you know, there are always the Christians that says it's justifiable just because of the fact that there were circumstances that would lead up to uh, to me losing my temper. But, you know, to truthfully, there's no one else's sins that justifies your sins. We have to be accountable and responsible to God for whatever we do. And, and I'm one of those people that uh, I'm accountable to God. And I struggled so desperately uh, to get rid of, of, of that, you know, that temper that was in my life or that anger where it was coming from. And, and again, I, there were days that I, one particular time, I remember being gone for three weeks and prayed and fasted and just asked God to deliver me from it because I knew that I couldn't go the places God wanted me to do and do what God wanted me to do, knowing that I had an underlying issue that was unresolved. I love it when people, at least it still bothers you, you know, I know of a minister who he I mean, he got radically saved, set free, was seeing power in his ministry. But at nighttime, he came out of he was a pimp. He was a drug addict, all these bad things. And everything was washed away except these filthy dreams at night. And he would just he would just cry and plead. he would go and talk to people. And they were like, you know, Jesus saves. He's done everything he's going to do. You just need to get used to this and how amazed he was when he finally 
found out that Jesus is the Luke 418, that he not only saves, yes. but he heals and he sets the captive free. And he got set free from the guilt and the shame, but he was it was good news. Some ministers, I think, um, like to hide it and the shame of it keeps them in it. That's one of the reasons I wanted to um to interview you because God's moving in your ministry right now and the places that you're going. But I love the humility and, and your willingness to say, Hey, Jesus is a whole God, the yes. Luke 418 God. So I want to hear about what happened that God answered the prayer that you've been praying. Well, uh, let me, uh, let me say this uh, and start that journey by simply saying that I think transparency is the key to walk in an intimacy with God. So many people don't want to be transparent about where they are. And I think sometimes the church and religion has a tendency to not let people expose their vulnerabilities, their struggles. But the Bible said, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. I say this all the time. God can't heal what you can't reveal. And the same way goes for deliverance. God can't deliver us from what we're not willing to expose. And, you know, we say that we expose it to God, but the truth is until we get it out there where we're not, a, we don't care what anybody else thinks or what they say, all we want is for God to set us free and for us to be who he called us to be. And, and I think when leaders can step up and tell their story, because the truth is I've been doing this 30 years and I've never met a leader yet that didn't fight their own battles, whether it was unforgiveness from church hurts or wounds or whatever it is, they all fight their own battles. But just like you said, they're sheltered and afraid to talk about it because they're afraid they'll be kicked out of the pulpit or they'll be, you know, people will turn on them. And, you know, we have to be beyond the fear of people and get to a place where what matters is God's will being done in our life. And so anyway, one night, uh, as you know, I've been a part of the North Georgia revival and uh, God just, uh, I preached the first 11 weeks of that revival and uh, it was amazing to watch what God did as he just transformed lives week after week after week. And Pastor Todd and I have said this many times, um, when, when that revival broke out for the first 11 weeks, nobody fell backwards. Everybody fell forwards. It was a time of repenting. It was a time of people just, God, just, I mean, just turning them inside out. It was just transformation. And then one, one Sunday when I wasn't preaching, they had a spontaneous baptism. And then it's like God started meeting people in the water and it was just amazing. And the miracles had been just unprecedented. So uh, Pastor Todd asked me after I preached one night, he said, Bishop, you got to get in the water. Will you, will you help baptize tonight? And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. So I get in the water and, and I'm telling you, listen, Lisa, I'm wrecked. The presence of God is so strong in this baptismal pool. I'm like hanging on to the glass going, oh God, <laughs> I'm no good to Marty. I can't even hardly have to baptize because the presence of God is so strong in that baptistry. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I helped and it went on till about midnight. There was, I don't know, maybe a hundred and something people that got baptized. And so long story short, he was closing the service out. We'd baptized the last person and, and the presence was still so strong. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Marty. You got one more. And so I, he asked me, he said, Lance, what do you want God to do for you in this water? And all I knew is that moment I had residue left in my life, something that didn't honor God. At that particular moment, I'll be honest with you, Lisa, it didn't come to my mind, my temper. I just knew I had residue. I thought maybe it was from some church hurts or some church wounds, things I had gone through, you know, as a pastor. And, you know, I just didn't want anything in my life at that moment that didn't bring honor and glory to God. And so when when Marty, you know, prayed for me and I went down in the water, now uh, this is going to be odd to some people. But when I came up, I exhaled. I don't remember taking a deep breath. But I exhaled for what seemed like five minutes. Now, I know that it was, and it was probably just a few seconds, but it felt like five minutes. And it felt like it wasn't going to stop coming. It just kept coming and kept coming, even to the point that I thought consciously as I was coming up out of the water, I thought consciously to myself, how long can one breathe outwardly without taking a breath in? That's how long it even came to my mind because it just kept blowing and blowing. And I didn't know if I was blowing water over the people because I didn't know I had my eyes closed. I just know that this thing just, and I just went limp as a dish rag. 
they just floated me over to the side of the baptistry. I mean, I couldn't have got up if I would have depended. It was like I was weak as, uh, as a rubber band. And, and God just, at that moment, I, I, it was gone. And I didn't even realize it till the days to follow that God had set me free from the thing that I'd prayed for so much uh, to be free from that anger and that temper. And, and in the days following, I had just this release of, 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 uh, I don't know. I just let it all go. I realized that I was still hurt with my dad, but it just, it was gone. It was just gone. I released it. And, you know, I, I can say this, I don't have any regrets in the days leading up to my father's passing. We were close and, and none of the things that were in me were going on in me ever came out outwardly. I never let that be expressed to him in any way, shape, form or fashion. So I don't have any regrets in that area, but it was something that Lance needed uh, to be able to be free was to release him. And even though that my dad knew beyond every shadow of a doubt, how much I loved him and, and respected him, even though it was a bad situation coming up. But as I said earlier, my dad got born again, but I needed to be delivered. I needed to let that go. And, it, and I guess just everything coming together, the, the culminating of circumstances and situations, all came to a, a, a moment in that water that night. And God just completely just, it left me. It physically left me. I believe it. I uh, love that story. What happened? In, has there been any changes, your family noticing any changes? And has there been any, any changes in your ministry since that moment? Absolutely. You know, anytime that God does something significant in our life and, and breaks something off of our lives, however you want to word it, delivers us from something, there's always that um, th that expression that's seen outwardly from the inward transformation. And yes, my, my family, my wife knows. I, I just, you know, things that used to upset me don't even bother me at all. And not even the, not things that would ever cause me that would have triggered me to lose my temper. I'm just talking about things that used to bother me and I would just get upset or real tensed out over. I just don't get tensed out over them anymore. You know, um, it's just like God gave me this, this tremendous nature change. <laughs> you know, I'd been born again, but he, he, God just perfected even more of that. So, uh, uh, yes, it's, it's affected my life in a very positive way. Uh, ministerially. Yes, I think so. Uh, you know, I've always been a, a strong leader. Sometimes people misinterpret my, my, my strong leadership style to being aggressive. But even in that, I think I'm a little bit more laid back than I used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's so cool. I was in Florida about, I don't know, it's a couple, like a couple of years ago, I guess it was. And I like to just ask the Lord about residue. So every once in a while, because, you know, in the ministry, you go through stuff. Yes. And, you know, sometimes things start hanging on. And I was laying there. Um, we were at like a condo and I was just praying. And I was like, God, if there's anything, I, I don't want anything that doesn't belong to you. And I literally felt something lift up off of me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okie dokie, didn't know that was <laughs> yeah. there. And I didn't know what it was. But when I came back, I think, and I think this happens a lot of times, you don't even know what it is God's done until you're living life. But when I came back, yes. I was headed into a meeting and suddenly I realized frustration wasn't there. And then I, I was late for an appointment and I realized the that tense frustration. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. That was something that didn't belong to me in the first place. And I had a complete attitude change. Didn't know I even needed it. But it's amazing how the little things we think are our personality or our responses to situations that if we give that to God, we, we are able to live in perfect peace, peace that yes. passes understanding. Amen. You know, I think there's a there's a, a lot higher level of victory that God intends for us to live in that so many Christians never receive because they think, oh, I got saved, so everything's well and everything's good. There's nothing else to be dealt with just because they got saved. And, and listen, I've been there and understood that, but what I've come to realize in my walk with God is that even though I might have got set free from something, 
that uh, when I was born again doesn't mean that I don't go through circumstances or I go through situations that inflict things on my life that I need to be delivered from later on as mm-hmm. I've been a believer. And people think, well, I'm, I'm not subject to those things. Well, that's just simply not true. Um, you know, uh, and, and when we get these scars and wounds, it, it makes a place for the enemy when we don't deal with them. And people don't realize that they think because I'm a Christian that the devil can't touch me. Well, I, that's not true. We make a place for him when we walk in disobedience, whether it's unforgiveness or, or, or an offense, whatever it is, and we refuse to let God deal with that and heal that in our lives, then, you know, it just opens the door up for strongholds. And I just, you know, I want people to be set free, Lisa. That's my heart. And, you know, because God has liberated me in so many wonderful ways. And there is such a victory that God wants us to live in, not just occasionally, but every day, not just at church church and a good service, but he wants us to walk in that victory every day. So much that that victory is seen by the people that we come in contact with every day through our interactions in life, that people can see Jesus in us. It's Jesus in us, the Christ in us is the hope of glory, Paul says. So I want people to see that victory. I want them to see it every day. And I want other people to walk in that victory that people see it in their life as well. Amen. Me too. What would you, what advice would you give to someone, man or woman that deals with, they don't want to have a temper. They don't want the rage that comes out that controls their family or controls their life, whether it's every day or once every four or five months, what counsel would you give to them to get set free from that? Well, I think a couple of things. Number one, as I'd be transparent, don't hide it. Because when you start hiding it, that's where the stronghold's set in. And, you know, I've seen people hide it. And then, you know, when you let one thing in, here comes a whole truckload. Uh, People sometimes don't get that, but it happens. You, You compromise in one area of your life and the enemy's coming in like a flood just because we refuse to let God deal with that one area of our life and be open about it. Um, I'll walk a million miles with somebody struggling as long as they're transparent about their struggles. And I think that's what God called the church to do. Uh, we have to walk with people while they're struggling. We have to minister. You can't give up on them. Now, if they're justifying it, that's another story. The Bible tells us is how to deal with it when people justify things in their life and, and, you know, they don't seek to change. But number one, I would say walk in transparency, uh, walk in honesty about where you are and walk in accountability. You know, I didn't, I don't think I got delivered by hiding it. I got delivered because I was transparent about it. My church knew I would always tell them, this is my weakness. This is where I'm battling. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, Lisa, I lost a few people over the years from it because I would actually say it, even though they never saw it, they would actually use it against me because I made it a public confession, but that's on them, not on me, uh, because I believe in transparency and, uh, I, I believe not only am I transparent with God, but I have to be transparent with other people as well that I choose to allow to hold me accountable. I think that's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Not hold me accountable by you sinner. You you're so bad, you wicked, vile person. But, but the person that says, let me pray for you. Let me help you. Let me walk with you through this. Let me pray over you. Here are scriptures, things to encourage people to be liberated and set free. So number one, transparency. And the, the second thing is, is I think we have to, we have to search our hearts about what we sometimes say that we've let go and we only let them go superficial, superficially, uh, not genuinely let things go. Um, and, and I can say this as it relates to my situation, I never dealt with it because I never wanted to harm my father's reputation. My dad was a very well-respected man. And I'm pretty sure that even my public confession would startle people, uh, to know that these things went on in our, in our home. And so they were things that just became unresolved issues. And even when I got born again, uh, I I don't think anything ever caused my father to go irate like my salvation did uh, because I left the family business to go in the ministry. So it only fueled the the violence or the anger, the, the verbal, you know, things, the things said behind each other's backs. It only fueled that division. But then once my dad got born again, nothing got dealt with. 
you know, publicly. I never was able to go to him and talk to him about how I feel. Um, and, and, and my dad was a strong man and he did, he did stand up one day in front of the family and tell us all that, you know, if I would have known today what I know about Jesus, if I'd have known it then, I'd have never done the things I did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was his way of, of apologizing that he acknowledged that, uh, that he had had a life transforming experience with Christ and he had never had that prior to that. And, and of course that eased a lot of that, but we never were able to, to have that conversation. And of course, after he passed, that made it impossible, but I dealt with it. I don't think it necessarily meant that I had to have a conversation with my dad, other than I just had to expose the fact that I've got some hurts in here that are not dealt with. And it wasn't just the anger. I think it was really the hurts that that anger inflicted on us that I just never allowed God to heal. And, and when all of that stuff came together in that baptistry, you know, my dad had just passed, all this stuff had happened. And, and my dad was in that same baptistry, you know, uh, he went there for healing uh, when he had, uh, when he had uh, his, his heart condition and we were trusting for his healing. But I believe he went on to be with the Lord because once again, my dad was, a, he was definitely a born again Christian and, uh, you know, he loved the Lord. But, and I would have never have said anything that would have harmed my dad's reputation. Uh, while he was alive and and today I, I, I would never harm his reputation because my dad died a very good man uh even though in, you know in his last days there were things and decisions that he made that i don't know were the best decisions that he could have made for his family uh but at the end of the day that's that's irrelevant uh people make mistakes every day but uh it doesn't negate their devotion to christ but uh, I, I didn't want to hurt my dad and i think that was part of the thing that um that kept me somehow or another from dealing with what was there if if that makes sense uh and i would tell people to search their hearts and and be as transparent as they can about how much they have really dealt with things that may have happened to them you know as a pastor i deal with people all the time who've been abused molested you, you you just name it i deal with everything as having rehab centers and things of that nature so i i deal with everything that you can imagine that have happened to people and i always say that nothing will surprise me but then every day i find something that shocks me that people have gone through and uh, uh we can sometimes think that we have dealt with it when the truth is we we just we just kind of suppressed it under uh, um, doing the right thing, so to speak. I, I prayed the right thing. I spoke the right thing. And, and instead of it really exposing it and being healed, we just suppress it. Uh, so I would tell people to search their hearts and, and make sure that you have truly asked God for his grace, his power, and his help to be liberated from scars or wounds or uh, uh, offenses, unforgiveness, whatever it might be. Amen. That is wise counsel. And he, he will obviously do it. He did it for you. Yes. He and sure it's did. stuck. <laughs> yes. It's lasted. Uh, I mean, this is three years and, and uh, you know, I'm so thankful uh for what he's done well, anger is 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 an emotion the bible says be angry and sin not um i'm just thankful that that anger does no longer it no longer controls me or affects me or takes control of me so to speak that uh and it doesn't mean i don't get angry it just means anger does not control me so that emotion is still there but it does not control what i do what i say how i behave or how i act I think it's great to have the emotion, but it's no longer controlling you. That is a wonderful, wonderful testimony. I loved hearing that. Is there anything else you want to add before we go? No, just to say that there's nothing that God can't heal. You know, there's not a there's not a stronghold. There's not a hurt. There's not an affliction. If we won't come and just bring it before God with transparency, He can heal us. He can set us free. No matter no matter how deep that wound runs, or no matter how great that anger might be, whatever it is, as you say so often in one of my favorite scriptures in the whole world, Luke four eighteen, and especially where He says He come to set the captive free. Amen. He did. Well, thank you for joining us on Freedom Friday. It's been so good to have you. And I believe your testimony is going to bless a lot of people. Well, thank you so much for having me, Lisa. And I look forward to seeing you guys this weekend. Uh, the revival continues. Yeah.